Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Better the Pond podcast, where we talk to amazing people doing incredible things that lead the charge of generosity. My name is Warren Berry, and I'm your host and the founder of Instinctive Solutions, where we believe that everyone is an odd duck, but that's what makes them awesome. Now, today, our guest is Kevin Balmer, the original, the one, the only, no schedule man. An off-the-cuff remark in a local gym sparked a fire in Kevin that he couldn't put out. From the days listening to his transistor radio as a child, led him on his journey to be a place of certainty for others and helping them discover their North Star and what they stand for. As Kevin wisely said, you can't find your treasure by following someone else's map. Kevin creates ripples and betters the pond by helping small and medium-sized businesses discover their story and how to fly like a phoenix but race like a turtle. Ladies and gentlemen, the no schedule man himself, Kevin Balmer. Kevin Balmer, I am I'm ecstatic. Uh, thank you ever so much for taking the time to be a guest on my Better the Pond podcast. It is great to have you. It's nice to be welcomed into the pond, Warren. Thanks. Let's just cannonball right in there and see if we can swim. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to, we're going to, well, there's going to be a lot of ripples today. Um, so, you know, and here's the thing you are, you know, you are the no schedule man, but, <laughs> but we had to schedule today. So is that like counterintuitive or? No, uh, the no schedule man keeps a, a, a schedule. I've got to keep track of what I'm doing. Otherwise it won't get done. Um, but the, the schedule is more like, you know, that old, or the reference to no schedule, that old phrase about we make plans and then God laughs or something like that. Um, can you move forward being comfortable, not knowing what's next? That's uh, kind of more it. That's you know? it. And <laughs> that is going to be part of your story. And I can't wait to dive into it. So this is going to be a lot of fun. All right. So you, are you ready? To, are you ready to fly? You ready to, ready to dig right into this? Always. We're going to fly or we're going to fall. <laughs> oh, no, we're, we're going to fly. <laughs> Either way, if we fall, we'll figure out how to open the chute. Absolutely. Exactly. All right, so so Kevin, uh, what got you from being a gosling, right? Back to the very beginning, you're a young gosling, to leaving the nest, to being the guy that you are today. Kevin Ballmer, what is your backstory? Take me back. Well, I started out in radio. I, I grew up as a kid that was listening to Detroit Tiger baseball games on a transistor radio that his grandfather gave him. I used to carry that around like a teddy bear, Warren, and I would fall asleep at night listening to the baseball games. And that led me into the, the path of media, TV and radio, and then I chose radio. So I oh, went to school oh, oh, for those. I got I to I cut you off. We're, we're going back to when you were a gosling. Where did, where, take me back to your humble beginnings, Kevin. Where did you start from? Where were you hatched? In London, Ontario, Canada. London, Ontario, the, the good fellow Canadian. Yeah, but my, my parents and grandparents were from a little place called Wallaceburg, Ontario, which is closer to Windsor, which is right across the border from Detroit. So we are, for those who don't know, in London, not a very original name, by the way. You won't surprise you to know that we have like one river running through this city, which they've called the Thames. <laughs> but in this corner of Ontario, we're pretty much equidistant between Toronto and Detroit, just to give people an idea. Now, you know, so again, yeah, put in a geographical location, right? So Windsor is actually further south than Detroit, is it not? Oh, you're asking me geography questions yeah, now? Yeah, the geography question. I'd have to, it's possible. I mean, they're right beside each other. So I, I, I believe, <laughs> it'd be close. It'd be a measure of a, a degree or two either way. I believe that, yeah, the people from Windsor right at the right of the tunnel there, right, are actually like further south into the U.S. than actually Detroit is. So they're like sort of pseudo Americans, but really, truly Canadians. Yeah, there's a lot of that in this neck of the woods, or yeah. at least there certainly was when I was growing up. All right, so there you are. You're you're in London, Ontario, Canada, and and tell me, yeah, tell me a bit about your backstory back then, and being a being a kid. And you, I said you obviously grew up listening to uh, to baseball, and that was your that was your thing. Yeah, I can't even remember how that started. Probably because because of my dad, I would guess. Uh, what's funny is I don't really follow it very much anymore. I think the Tigers have been awful for so long that I haven't really paid much attention. But, um, but that was a really important part of, of my growing up. My dad was a, 
a really great athlete. And uh, so I was the kind of kid that was always wrecking around with his friends and played just about every sport that we could. But I remember it was that radio that my grandfather gave me and, and I really did carry it around. It was about the size of a brick. And, and I don't know why, but I just, I got interested in how a voice could come through this little machine and help me see things that, that I couldn't see for myself. And, uh, and then that just sort of all came together into a curiosity for that sort of stuff. I, I was always a, a bit of a blabbermouth you know, I could always talk a lot. I was the kid that was winning the public speaking contests at elementary school and was the class valedictorian in grade eight and, and things of that nature. And, uh, and there was a radio and TV arts program that I took in high school that I enjoyed a lot and then eventually went into radio broadcasting. But that's what I always remember, Warren, is going back to that, that radio that my grandfather gave me and carrying that around. So was it, what about it was, I mean, was it actually listening to the game or was it more about just somebody painting you a picture in your mind of actually being in that, you know, being in the stadium and being in the stands, was it taking you to, you know, was it that ability for that announcer to take you somewhere else? I think that was part of it, but you know, with the benefit of hindsight, now that I've been around for a while, when I think back about it, Part of what I believe the appeal was, and maybe still is, Warren, is the reliability of something familiar being there. I was also pretty sick as a kid, asthmatic, and in and out of hospitals a lot. That's a lot better now, but, uh, but that was a, a big part of my story when I was growing up. And I would not only listen to those, the games at night, but I would turn the radio on in the morning and now that was 760 WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes. <laughs> they were a news talk station. So I would turn it on in the morning and there's a, a fellow named JP McCarthy who's who's been gone for a long time now, but he'd be doing the morning show, but he'd be talking about news and politics and things related out of Detroit, but I would listen to it. <laughs> I came to know his voice and I remember not even realizing there was an FM radio to listen to until probably in my teens. I just, I didn't know, I didn't care. Uh, but when I look back on it more and I think about how whenever I needed it, it was like the soundtrack to my life, that voice, Ernie Harwell's voice in the evening from Tiger Stadium and J.P. McCarthy's voice in the morning. They were always there every time I turned it on. And there was a comfort in that. And when I look at the, the through line of what I've done in the time since and what I'm doing now, I wonder if there isn't some measure of that for me that that I hope to, to maybe be that at some level for other people to just provide some some level of reliability and, and comfort of just just being there if that makes any sense oh that makes great sense and I was just having this conversation uh just yesterday as a matter of fact and one of the things about doing you know the the podcast and I'm talking to amazing people like yourself was the fact that, you know, when you look back at somebody's story, you look back at their history, there was, there was a moment in time that was kind of defining um, and where something had a great impact and effect on them, right? And, it's, and as you follow the story through, it's weaving its way through to what they're doing today. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. And so you, when you think about, you know, listening to yourself talk about being on the radio and but, but you had that certainty there was a, there was that safety there was that little there was that soft place to land for you you know in that radio and if you think about and as we get into, further into your story right just getting to know you is that you're kind of you're yeah you're doing the same thing for others so what others did for you you're trying to do for people down the road and there's that connection and I've seen that pattern through a lot of people that I've talked to it's fascinating I think I see it that way now, Warren, but I don't think that I did at the outset. I, I think I was focused more on what I was doing as opposed to why I was doing it. And mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, we, we don't even necessarily know. We're just doing what we think it is that we're supposed to do. Follow the map, follow the script, follow the blueprint, which is part of the whole no schedule thing, that there is no map. <laughs> there is no blueprint. We just have bought into this idea that we think that there is. And for some of us, it's certainly been true for me. You get a certain distance down the, the, the road, that journey in life, and realize you've checked off most or all of the boxes that you felt like you were supposed to, and you're still left wanting. 
or maybe even worse, that you're you're really grappling with some difficult feelings and some sense of meaning and just an overall sense of fulfillment and contentment that that is missing, perhaps, mixed with an awareness of the the sand really falling through the hourglass. I hear myself saying a lot these days that you can't find your treasure by following someone else's map. And yet it seems like I know for certain that's what I did until life kind of blew up on me. Um, and I started asking some of those questions of myself. Um, but it takes a lot of courage, I think, to go your own way and to just sort of trust <laughs> yourself and the universe or whatever you want to refer to that as that, uh, that things will work out. And um, to your point that you made a couple of moments ago, when I look back, I can definitely see how communication and the way that we, we communicate and, uh, and, and that sort of reliability, that consistency, that, that, that comfort, that relationship is maybe a, a, a better word to use, uh, are all things that have, have kind of woven themselves into the fabric of, of who I think I am and am becoming. Mm -hmm. um, I was just making down a note down here. Is you can't find your treasure by following someone else's map. Can I, can I use that as an official quote of Kevin Ballmer? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you I, hear something that you think is interesting, go ahead and run with it. I have, I have a, I have a better the pond wall in my office, and for everyone who's on the podcast, I, I grab a quote from, and then I put that on the wall as part of the, it's the community, right? And uh, and then you know, and then I share that, so hopefully it inspires others. So there you go. There is their official quote from you that's going to go on the wall right there. I Good. So it. are we done? We should no, just no. Leave, like, oh, yeah. like George Costanza, leave him on a high note. That's it. Thanks, Warren. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> no, we got a long way to go, my friend. And All right. Okay. Together. I'll see if I can find, I'll see if I can see something else noteworthy. <laughs> so, you know, so there you, you know, you grew up in London, you were listening to the radio, you were, uh, you were, uh, you know, you were a Detroit fan. Um, you, you were, uh, you know, you were a talker, so you got your valedictorian and you won public speaking, all those, you know, and was so, um, in high school and you said, well, you said you were sick. So it was an interesting thing. You say that, that, you know, you were very sports orientated, but also you were reasonably unhealthy when you grew up. So how did that play out? That's something I haven't thought about in a long time, Warren, um, several doctors told me not to do certain things because I was the kid that not only had the asthma inhaler, but I had this compressor that would, would help me take this saline solution, like a mist. If you think about like an oxygen mask and I'd have to do that at a minimum four times a day. Nebulizer was not, they called it. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember we had one that you could operate by foot pump that was kept at the, the office at school. Um, in case I had a, a, an attack and a flare up. It's interesting that I don't think about that as much as I think about, I played minor hockey when, when I was younger. And I remember the, the school playground was just the gathering place for my friends and I, we'd always be out in the baseball diamonds or the basketball courts or just running around or playing street hockey in the winter time. That's, that's just what we did. Uh, I do remember going into grade eight that I had decided I wasn't going to be able to ever out sprint anyone <laughs> with track and field, but I could probably outlast them, which is another theme that, that has, um, <laughs> has found its way back across my path. There's a turtle over my shoulder here and I got a little turtle charm necklace here. And I assure you, I wasn't thinking about that then, but it's, it's come back to me. And I remember thinking I could probably run distance and, and, and beat these cats that way. And I remember the doctors saying, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that because of your, you know, your lungs. And I, I thought, I remember thinking even at that age, Warren, well, if I have an asthma attack, I mean, if I get sick, I'll stop and I'll get treatment, but otherwise, doesn't it make sense for me to do something that would further develop my lung capacity that would force me to breathe more deeply and, I remember that summer everywhere where my friends rode their bikes, I just jogged along beside them. And, uh, and then that year I, I ended up, I think fourth in the city in the 1500 meters <laughs> because I just developed this opportunity to run and, and keep running. And, uh, 
was given the cross country and track and field award at, at grade eight graduation. It's, it's funny that that comes back. It's funny to me in my recollections of that time, because I think what that solidified in my mind was that just because somebody is sort of an expert in a certain area doesn't necessarily mean they know what's best for you. That ultimately it's up to us to know ourselves and trust ourselves and take responsibility for ourselves and, and choose accordingly, but not to limit ourselves and our experience based on someone else's advice, however well-meaning and informed it may be, mm -hmm. uh, that it ultimately, that responsibility rests with ourselves. So I guess I would say that I was, you know, I dealt with the, the illness. There were times where it made itself so apparent, apparent that you didn't have any choice. <laughs> but when I look back and think about it in terms of answering your question, I guess I'm pleased that I didn't let it define me, that I, I don't feel like I lacked um, anything growing up, at least in terms of athletics or things. What I, I, I do recall going forward are, are, are things like having to sit on a chair when all my other classmates were sitting on the floor and not liking that. Because then the thinking was, we can't have him down close to like the dust and the dirt because that'll flare up his allergies. And now you would think something like, oh, well, you get to sit in a chair while all the other kids get to sit in the dirt. You should be happy about that. But when you're in grade two, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's traumatic. But when I look back on that, that memory sticks in my mind. I didn't want to be in the chair. I wanted to be with the other kids. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff, I think, from that time in my life, as there is for all of us, to reflect back on and see how the patterns of our thinking and our identifying ourselves and what we believe about ourselves and each other's really kind of gets its roots. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that is a fantastic story. And I, I love how you presented that. And, you know, and, and how I see that too, Kevin, is that, you know, your, your, your doctor, right, actually did you a favor, right? He, he did you a great favor because he told you you couldn't or you shouldn't, right? You shouldn't do that. And you went, wait a second, right? So you leveraged that and said, wait, shouldn't I be, right? And so that you, he gave you the gift of actually expanding yourself, although you didn't see it at the time, right? But that's actually truly what happened because then you expanded yourself and to do something greater. And, and I heard that part of the story too, right? And you can see how that weaves in even presently to the work that you're doing. Can you see that connection? Absolutely. And I, again, I've since learned it's that contrast, that conflict, that struggle that we think it's our job to avoid, <laughs> but that is inevitable and a very necessary part of growth. And in a lot of cases, it's what gives uh, this adventure so much meaning is that each time you you challenge yourself and you expand and you learn and grow, you're always going to get another set of contrasting experiences that you either move forward, whether you want to consider that some manifestation of the hero's journey or not, you either confront those things or you shrink from them and, and let outer circumstances define you rather than you trying to, to discover that yourself. And then also mixing that with just the, the experiences that we're going to have as part of just being human that all of us take turns with. And when we're taking our turns with something difficult, it's so common I've found for us to feel like it's just us. I'm the only one who's sick. I'm the only one who's struggling with a relationship or I'm less than because I'm unhappy at this job or I can't figure out how to make this amount of money. Or, and, and it just, it feels in those times like you know, like the whole world is shining a light on us and going, oh, for shame, you're the one on the chair and the rest of us are all down here on the floor where we should be, uh, freak. And it amazes me, Warren, to find out how many of us feel like that when we're just being human. And that when we have embraced conflict and contrasting situations and challenged ourselves to rise to those occasions, it, it's amazing how we find ourselves, I think, more equipped to not only deal with those challenging situations when they come, but to maybe not have those waves be quite as intense seeming as they may have otherwise, if we're just always braced against them. And how we seem to, it feels like we see fewer of them <laughs> because we don't get worked up over stuff as much that isn't as worth getting worked up about. And uh, that all 
in my mind plays back into the whole no schedule man thing as well is that you know the waves come and go but we're more like the ocean you know we're we're will remain and uh some waves are going to knock you over and you kind of need to wave tread water for a while and hope somebody comes and picks you up and some you can ride but pretending that you're ever going to get to the point where you can control the ocean to where it's always going to be calm that ain't ever going to happen uh, and like, realistically we wouldn't want that anyway that's true I, I would agree with you um and the next question is going to come up after this one though as we as we move through this on the podcast um i think we're going to dive a little bit deeper in what you just talked about so i'm gonna so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna be try to be a good steward of time and i'm gonna keep moving you through this and um and so i want you to tell me kevin about like what about your teenage years did you did you work did you have jobs what you know take me kind of from your teenage years and walk me into through, through your journey to the to where you presently are today yeah i worked i had jobs i um through the latter part of high school and through college, I worked at Red Lobster restaurant. <laughs> and what did you do at Red Lobster? What was your everything? <laughs> everything. I started as a dishwasher and uh, then worked in the kitchen, worked in the production area, ended up being somebody that would, would help prep the food after the kitchen uh, put it together. Then I moved up to the front of the house, host as a host, like seating people at their tables and then eventually being a, a server. And, um, so that, that kept me busy through, through those times, um, the latter part of high school, I think I mentioned, um, I did a, a program I actually went to a different high school than what would have been my home school. Like where most of my friends from elementary school, when I went to a different school so that I would have the chance to get into this radio and TV arts program, which I did, which was a two-year program. And, um, and I was the kind of guy that, I mean, I would be there scratching on the door, waiting for the professor to open it up in the morning, and then they would have to kick me out at night. Uh, I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And I would take cameras and I would take them to all of the, the school football games and basketball games and things like that. And then I would edit together highlights. And um, I just was fascinated being at that editing suite. It's interesting to me, Warren, that I ended up choosing radio um, and, and, and being on the air because I enjoy just as much, if not more the behind the scenes stuff, the, the creating stuff of, of editing tape and matching things to music and having an idea and shooting it and then putting it together. And so I really enjoy when I think about some of the, the ancient machines and the tapes that we used to use to edit video and cut things together and generate graphics, how everybody now is holding basically a mobile uh, movie and an audio studio in their palm of the hand with with their phones so it's a lot of fun I, I really enjoy tinkering around with with a lot of that stuff and it's something that I really aspire to do more of to have a an actual studio where we can create not just for myself but for so many other people um, that's a big part of my vision for, for going forward and I think it got it, its roots there but one of the things that also defined me when I was in in those high school age years was I got really restless, angry even, because that radio and TV arts program was a two-year program. And in the first year, you would take it all afternoon. And in the second year, you'd take it all morning, so, meaning that you would, in the other two classes of the day, you'd take other subjects. In the second year, I wanted to make sure that I got as much of that as I possibly could. So I didn't take any other classes. I just did that. And I was there all day long, as I already mentioned. But the cost of that was that after I came out of the other side of that, I still had other credits to get to graduate high school. And I didn't appreciate that very much. <laughs> I thought, I've done what I came here to do. I'm good at it. You know, I won all the awards, broadcast of the year and blah, blah, blah. I want to go and do, I don't know why I'm sitting in this American history class when I know I want to go and do this and I'm qualified and I've proven that I can do it. And I didn't have the emotional intelligence and maturity back then to understand what was happening. And I went to college for radio, partly because it was a two-year program and not a four-year university degree. And I, I regret that, Warren. I wish I'd had that experience. Hmm. But I was really restless. I just wanted to get at doing what I wanted to do. And I remember even at that time, not wanting to be associated with you know the other kids who were just partying and goofing off and you know having fun 
um, I just wanted to get on with it. And um, I've had to do a lot of healing uh, because I realized that 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 mindset set in right around that time when I was 16, 17, 18. And then once I got to around 2010, 2011, I started really actively trying to undo a lot of that stuff. But uh, I feel like I'm getting ahead of us a little bit. But um, that's what I really remember from that time, uh, high school and college for sure. So let me ask you this question, Kevin. Um, that's intriguing. You have me unbelievably curious. Um, so when you, if you, you know, I saying that you would take the two-year college program versus taking the four-year university program and you, and that was a regret. Um, looking back, if you were to sort of reflect on it for a second, what do you think, would the outcome have been different if you chose one over the other? No, we'll never know. I would assume that it would have had to, to some degree, just from the, the sheer mechanics of it. Um, I, I don't know that I had the patience to do that. And that's one of the reasons to reference the turtle again now, I try to remind myself to just slow down. And that when that wave does come, maybe the, that wave is restlessness, anger, judgment. Um, not to resist it so much, but to just sort of sit with it. I didn't understand how quickly time goes by. <laughs> so now if I'm making a, say a five-year plan, I have a vision for where I want to be when I'm in my early fifties. I just turned 47. Now I look at that and I go, I, I better be on this every day. Cause that's going to go by in the blink of an eye. You know, and here when I was 17, 18, I had the marks. I was an honor student, but I like, I could not foresee sitting and doing something for four years felt like an eternity for me. And would I have had the chance to learn more about myself and other people and maybe get a little bit more cultured and less sort of narrow minded? Perhaps, I don't know. And, but, and then I would also argue, you know, we are who we are because of what we've done. Mm -hmm. And I think that I am kind of a unique mix of uh, experiences because of the journey that I've had. So, I mean, on one hand, I'd argue you, you, you can't have regret. You can't look back. You, you, we need to appreciate all of the good things that have come from, from the experiences that we've had. But, you know, these are things that I talk to my sons about of like, yeah, there are things that if I could have them back, I would have chosen differently. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one of them and here's why how it would be different i don't know maybe we'll find out if there's if there's another life <laughs> <laughs> well you know i the, the reason i bring that up is is that it reminds me a, a lot of myself when i looked at going to college so i took a three-year college program versus going to uh four or five years in university the thought of going into university for 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 four or five years was like i I, I just, it was an eternity and I just couldn't, I was like, no, that is, that does not interest me. And I cannot, and I just can't see myself enduring that. So I chose not to, right. And I, and I, so I took a different path and I'm glad I took that path because it led me to where I am today. Um, you know, would the outcome have been different? I'm making the same, same answer. I don't know, but at that time it was like, Nah, that that's just that's just not me and I was I was trusting myself I was trusting my own gut to guide me along you know along that path and there was of course circumstances and events that kind of led to it but um but again same kind of thing of of you know what I what I'm when I'm listening to you I hear this kind of like you got this I got the strong work ethic I just want to get there I want to oh, the, the rubber's gonna hit the road and I want to go right and and you know what I think it was, Warren, now that I look back, is um, it wasn't that I wanted to go to university or not or do this job or not. It was that um, I wasn't happy and I didn't know that I wasn't. Ah. I just thought that's how life was. I didn't see that, that, that I, I was unhappy and I was trying to engineer a solution to that. Once I get this, then that. Mm. Once now we're back to that, that map, that blueprint, once I have this job, once I'm in this industry, once I get into this marriage or whatever that recipe is, then I'll be happy. And um, what I found was that <laughs> there was no there, <laughs> there. And it's just having this discussion with you and, and listening to what you're sharing. And thank you for that. 
I haven't even thought about the fact that, it, you know, it's interesting, I think, for me to, to say that I would look back on something like not going to university with regret. Because I, I also look at a lot of these established, this is how you do life blueprints with a somewhat jaundiced eye and still feel like that kid who the doctor told you can't run or you'll get sick. So I went, okay, thank you for your input. Watch this. <laughs> um, that I, I sort of, in the things I do consider myself as I'm like kind of my own little pirate ship without the robbery and horrible hygiene, but just going my own way. So it's interesting and maybe somewhat counterintuitive to that idea that that I would look back on something that's a little bit more viewed as part of an established path with some measure of regret. And maybe that's just part of the process that I'm still trying to go through of just reconciling with myself and really embracing who I really am and not overanalyzing or overthinking it, which has <laughs> been another thing. It's been a bit of big homework assignment. <laughs> Welcome to life. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so um, bring me up to speed uh, and to uh, Kevin Ballmer's present day life. And, you know, as I was looking at some of your material, I mean, you've made music, you you are the no schedule man, you're doing uh, um, you're doing your media company, there's all sorts of things happening. So, so, you know, tell my listeners what's going on presently. Well, to get there, I don't know that I fully answered your previous question about how we got there uh, to make a long story as succinct as I feel like I can. I did get into radio and no surprise quickly got restless with that as well, <laughs> but it was while I was uh, in the radio industry looking for any chance to be on the air more that I could, that I got roped into co-creating and producing and selling and co-hosting this weekly talk show about local auto racing. I had heard of Dale Earnhardt at this point. This would have been 1998, Warren, and that's it. Uh, but I figured I could learn. Like we talked about earlier, jumping out of the plane and then figuring out how to open the parachute on the way down. I just wanted to be on the air. I thought, how hard could it be? Seven years from that date, I was the general manager of an NASCAR sanctioned stock car track <laughs> here in <laughs> Southwestern Ontario. So needless to say, that escalated quickly. <laughs> we, uh, we started this radio show and we had it sold out before we ever did the first episode. And within three years, I had left hosting the morning show at the radio station I was working for to become the sales and marketing director at this racetrack. Uh, I had already been announcing there for a couple of years as their track announcer. And then I started being uh, serving as the, the national series announcer. Next thing I knew, I was the general manager. Did that for almost three years and just completely burned myself out. Uh, then I put together a partnership where I was a, a part owner in an event management company. And we did that for about four years. And then life blew up, then went through a separation and divorce right at the same time, the event management company scaled itself down. Um, and at that time I went back into radio, but in the sales end of things, because I just, I wanted flexibility to make my own schedule, not miss any of my, make my own schedule, right? <laughs> uh, not miss any activities while my kids were young and things of that nature. And so I was working with a lot of small to mid-sized businesses on their advertising campaigns and their digital advertising and really just kind of surviving, to be honest with you, Warren, uh, for a period of almost six years I did that for, but it was in that period of time that I really began asking myself the kinds of questions of, you know, who are you and, and what are you really here to do? What are the things that you're going to regret if you get to the end of your life that you haven't done or tried? What are the things that you're doing because you think that you, you're just supposed to be doing them as opposed to that they really mean something to you? Um, that's the era where I started the podcast. I started doing a lot of personal growth and development work. I was getting counseling. I was reading books faster than I could um, just as fast as I could read them, I guess I'll say it that way. And then lights started kind of coming back on and, and that's, uh, I started speaking and it was 2016 ish that I was like, I got to get, I got to get out of this radio station gig. First of all, this is this, they're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic <laughs> being in terrestrial radio or, or traditional TV with no disrespect intended. The world's not changing in that regard. It changed. And they didn't see it. And I'm like, I got to get out. Where are we going to get out to? 
Um, and then in 2017, I stepped away from that role with the radio to just try to go on my own as a speaker and a coach. And that's, uh, <laughs> you really find out what you're made of then. Um, but the, the through line and the thread through all of those things, Warren, is media, certainly understanding media, both from, from producing or actively being a part of it, but also buying it. So when I was at the racetrack, when I was at the event management company, I was the one that was responsible for putting together marketing campaigns and doing all the advertising and dealing with the reps and the writers and all of those kinds of things, uh, putting together sponsorship partnerships, whether it's for a, a, a race series or an event night or a hospitality event for a, a corporate partner or a billboard sign or a trade show space, working with small to mid-sized businesses. Then when I was back in radio, but on the sales side, now I'm working with all kinds of different businesses. I might be in an auto shop one moment, a, a florist the next moment, a manufacturing company who's searching for people the next moment, a grocery store the next moment, and found that I just, I really enjoyed that. I really liked getting to know people and became curious and why they do what they do and uh, how they do it in their own unique way and what their challenges are. And then mixing that up with just sort of the own, my own personal growth stuff that I was doing post 2010 kind of life blow up of like, how do I, how do I do this? Like, how do you, how do you become a happy person? How do you wake up each morning feeling a little bit more fulfilled and less restless, angry, blaming, um, finger wagging, um, like you need to reach for things to distract yourself more. How do you create a life that you don't feel like you need to distract yourself from? <laughs> and the more I have dived into that war and the more fascinated I've become with sharing that and then also integrating it into the kind of work I do to help small and mid-sized businesses with their marketing, which is just communication, really. And we don't know how to communicate effectively as human beings. What I've learned through the personal stuff is we don't even know what the heck we're saying to ourselves <laughs> and the effect on that, let alone how we're communicating to and affecting other people. So the trick has been boiling that down into a, an elevator pitch, <laughs> which I'm also not really big on. Um, <laughs> in real life, we call those pickup lines yeah. and we laugh at them. But in the business world, we have all of this other different kind of language. So that's, although that was a sort of long-winded answer, that's about as succinct as I can make that journey um, those are the ingredients that go into the soup. I haven't even talked about the, the music part of, of it yet, uh, but that was just really more of a personal curiosity. And that's where the no schedule man thing came from that, that and the idea for that song just popped into my head one day when I was the furthest thing from living the no schedule lifestyle, still very much controlling and restless and probably a little bit angry and combative. And then this idea of a character who was the antithesis of that came into my consciousness and I've been trying to embody that ever since. So, you know, share, share with me a little bit more about the no schedule man. Um, it was that, was, you know, was that just an aha moment that sort of popped in and how did, and how has that played out into the work that you're doing presently? It is for, for me, it's the North star. It's the magnetic North on the compass that I've constantly got to check and see if I'm, being that or just trying to control my own experience and that of others so that I can engineer the world to turn in a way that is to my liking, <laughs> which I think is what a lot of us are trying to do without realizing. And it's a, probably a fruitless task. It certainly was for me. When I talk about music, I don't consider myself a musician. I just, for some reason, wrote songs. I love, like, I've always got music going. I'm very passionate about the, the musicians that I listen to. And um, they're kind of similar in that respect, I think, Warren, to when we talked earlier about the, that, that comfort, whether it's a voice coming over the radio or um, why do we love the, the songs that we love so much. Um, so I'm very, I'm, I'm passionate and enthusiastic about that. But I'd always written songs, not because I wanted to be a musician, but just because they just kept showing up. I'd get these ideas and I'd write them down or I'd hum them into a little 
handheld tape recorder or something like that. And then I got to the point where I thought, I'd like to at least share some of these. So I was working on putting together a, an album of songs just because it was something that I didn't want to die without doing. And, uh, and I had been working on that project for quite some number of months. This is back in 2007. Now we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and I had kind of worked a song out on a guitar with a series of chords that I could play, but I didn't know what it was about, which was backwards from how I would normally write. Usually just lyrics would show up in my mind, then I'd write them down and then I'd, I'd try to put a song to it. Um, and then one day I was, uh, I was at the gym that I still go to or used to <laughs> before it was locked down. <laughs> well, again, and there was a fellow there that I used to see most mornings named Chan, who was in his mid seventies, originally from South Korea. I adored this man. Uh, he used to always call me young fella. And I was trying to think at this time about what that song was, what the lyrics might be. And I was there in the morning and getting dressed, getting ready to go to work for the day. And Chan came shuffling around the corner and, and he looked up at me and he says, oh, hey there, young fella, you go do your work. You go make your money now. And I'm not making fun with the affectation. That's how he sounded. Yeah. Um, and I said, yeah, it's Chan. It's time for me to you know, go off and run the world. What about you? And I'll never forget. He's, he's gently started sitting down and untying his shoes. And he says, oh, you know, you know me every day, always the same. I am a no schedule man. <laughs> and at that moment, I was, I was walking to where the sinks are so I could shave. I think back on that and imagine that there must have been like a cartoon light bulb <laughs> right above my head. Because these words just started pouring into my mind. I am a no schedule man. No plan is all part of the plan. I clear the calendar whenever I can and I've got the whole world in the palm of my hand. Blue jeans, ball cap, ready to roll, all else beyond my control. All day, all play, all clear all the way. I'll get there when I get there, if I get there at all. I am the waves and tide and wind because I roll in and out again, passing with nomadic chagrin to the next great adventure if I get there at all. And, and those words and two other voices besides um, just poured into me. And I went to sit in the sauna with my buddy and he wanted to chat about stuff. And I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> because I just want to remember these words. And then I finally went in, out into the car and I wrote them all down. And that's where that started. And I looked at it and I thought, here's a, a character who just goes with the flow. Mm -hmm. he, he, he doesn't view life as linear. Like it doesn't work like the crow flies where you put, think of an old sailing ship and this treasure map idea. Again, you put an X on the map where you think your treasure is. And then you set sail off to go and get it. Well, it's not a direct route. You're going to get blown sideways. You're going to end up in some places that you didn't plan on. You're going to meet other people. You're going to get battered by some storms, but you're going to get through them and it's going to be an adventure. And you may end up somewhere completely different than where you thought you were headed out to begin with. But that initial desire, that X on the map is what got you moving forward. That's what got you in motion so that you would have all these experiences to begin with. And this, this guy that just was content to keep moving forward and, and was happy with whatever happened always in the moment, which was completely not how I was at that time. We're very controlling. Things have to be this way. It has to be very linear. Um, and it's just that idea that I, the song itself that we recorded, one day I'll go back and redo it because I don't I hate to sound like one of these guys, but I don't really like it that much. I never listened to it because I don't, I used to like playing it live, but the recorded version of it, uh -huh. but the name, that idea just keeps following me around. And it seems like everything that I do keeps coming back to that idea of like, are you just are you riding the waves or are you tensing against them? Are you trying to control the, not the ocean, the pond so that there's never a wave? Are you embracing the ups and downs? You know, are you, you know, are you being playful? Are you giving your complete attention to the people and the circumstances where you are right now and the only thing that exists? Or are you delaying your sense of gratification to something that may never happen or letting your experience in the now be dictated by a memory of something that's dead and gone that doesn't exist anymore. And um, I find it 
really interesting that I, it's, so what are we, it's 2021 now. It was 2007, that lyrical idea was just delivered from where, I don't know. I didn't sit down and think, let's write a song. It just showed up. It was Chan who pulled the cork right. <laughs> with that phrase. You know, it's interesting. And I listened to that story, Kevin. I mean, that's the alchemist. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And maybe that's why I absolutely sobbed when I read that book. Right. Because that's really become part of your story. Right. I mean, that is that is the alchemist. That is that is fascinating. And I and I love how, you know, one day I'm in that space at that time. And that person said that one thing and everything changed. Yeah. It, it's fantastic. So to be a good steward of time, I'm going to keep us moving on here. Kevin, I love the story. That is, uh, that's amazing. So I believe that we're all odd ducks. I believe that we're all misfits, right? So can you tell me about a time, and I'm sure you'll have a story behind this, of, you know, when you were an odd duck, when you were different, when you actually, you were, you stood out and, and, you know, what made you, you, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, you know, this isn't about bragging or anything, right? Is, but what makes you different and what makes you the odd duck and how have you put that out into the world? A couple of things come to mind. One is in my time in the motorsports industry and racing, when I, I, I kind of shudder at a little bit of it now because the changes that we made when they gave me the keys as the general manager um, <laughs> were a little bit more aggressive than I, I might make now, at least in terms of how many, how, how fast. But I didn't grow up conditioned by that, like in that environment. So I didn't have a preconceived notion of the way things are or have to be. This is how we do things. So when I would see something that just from a, a, a plain human perspective, I thought just doesn't make sense, we would change it. And, and I think I was viewed as, uh, as a little bit of a maverick. Um, but I got away with it because we had the race teams, and the drivers on our side, which was something else that a lot of other people in roles like mine at other facilities viewed with disdain because the paradigm was you make the rules you're the dictator it's it's them against you and if they don't like it they don't have to come and i didn't view it that way i viewed it as well they're our partners without them we have no business it's it's insanity <laughs> to suggest <laughs> that you wouldn't take the feedback of your partners and so we did a lot of things that um you aren't supposed to be able to do and succeeded because uh, I wasn't afraid of what I didn't know, but also just looked at things from what I thought was kind of a common sense perspective. And now I I'm, I'm, feel like I'm still trying to do the same thing. I'm both trying to challenge myself with that on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. to challenge my own ideas and my own beliefs and be a, aware without overdoing it to my own detriment of, uh, of, of what maybe some of those ideas and beliefs are that might be holding myself back. But even maybe a quick example is somebody who helps businesses with, with their marketing and in particular, their social media presence and things of that nature. That's one of the things that I speak and, and coach on a lot. It's just, it, it, to me, it's obvious. We don't talk as human beings. We don't communicate with each other the way that we advertise at each other. If we did, we wouldn't like each other very much. <laughs> just, you know, just look at it that it, and not to get into the weeds of giving too many examples, but it's just, it's plainly obvious to me, mm -hmm. but these are the rules enga of engagement. This is how it's done. Mm -hmm. And so I like to maybe be that odd duck, not to try to be controversial, but to just go like, just, just look at this from a, if, if your friends or your the people that you have relationships with tried to communicate to you, by boasting and bragging and, and shaming and nagging and hurrying and rush, rushing you, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't engage. You would never engage. So why in the world would you try to represent your business that way? Mm -hmm. Well, because that's just the way that it's done. I'm like, okay, well, it's not the way I'm going to do it. Um, so there's that, that, again, that tension, that balance between how do you meet the world where it is so that they'll understand you from a perspective of where they are and that you can maybe end up helping them versus how do you have a more original voice 
Mm-hmm. You know, if you've already seen this before, you already know what my uh, unique selling position is and what, what the, and the outcome is, well, then what the heck do you need me for? Right. But I don't know whether people are actively searching things for things that are new. They want to do things their way when their way is not working. Right. <laughs> They're just well. used to telling themselves that they are. So that's the space that maybe I'm trying to navigate and figure a way through. But, you know, and listening to that, uh, Kevin, too, right, it, that's the doctor story coming back out again, right? Is the, is the doctor saying, you shouldn't run, right? That Because that's what that's it's supposed to be, right? So there's, I'm going to limit you and say that this is what you're not supposed to do because that's the way that it's always been done. And you say, well, wait a second. No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this in a different direction and I'm going to grow from it. It's the same story weaving itself back out through again. Yeah, I've never thought of it in that respect until this conversation, Warren. Um, I wonder what other times there have been like that. But when I think back about who my heroes are, they're all the Han Solo characters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Never tell me the odds. You're not actually flying into an asteroid <laughs> field, are you? <laughs> well, they'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, those are the ones, the, the Captain Jack Sparrows, those that just always, they're not afraid to be contradictory, but you can't help but love them. They don't mean any harm. They just aren't going to believe this systemic paradigm and then they go their own way but but they're always going to be there for you you know but uh um those are the characters that i really relate to the most and uh i wouldn't go so far as to say that i'm like that but i do think that i see the world that way i look at a lot of things and kind of go hey, we're just sort of sleepwalking here we've already talked about the alchemist i keep thinking about the four agreements mm-hmm. in my mind as i'm discovering some of that as well and what's funny is a former colleague of mine at the radio stations in the time when I was selling uh, gifted me with both of those books, Warren. She gave me both the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz and later gave me the alchemist and said, I think you want to read this, Kevin. <laughs> Two of my favorite books, actually the four agreements is my favorite book of all time. Yeah. Uh, the alchemist I absolutely love. Um, and if I can throw one more at you down, if you haven't read it already is the untethered soul. by oh. Michael Fisher. So that one, I don't know if you're a note taker or a highlighter when you read books. (laughs) I'm I'm actually, I I just read and then absorb. Oh, I'm a, I I like to highlight things and whatnot. And then I'll often go through back, back through books and just sort of skim over highlighted passages. Untethered soul is almost completely yellow. (laughs) (laughs) Looked like a dog lifted its leg on it because it's just, um, Good call on that one. <laughs> so um, can you tell me a time, Kevin, when someone did something for you that left an impact in your life? And I, and I think we probably already touched on this already, but I won't see if anything else comes to mind because obviously Chan obviously did something for you by, by making that one statement. But was there anything else that comes to mind when someone did something for you that left an impact in your life? Well, there, there are a number that, that, that come to mind. Um, I'll only mention a couple. One is our mutual friend, Gare Maxwell. When I started my own podcast and I reached out to him because I was intrigued by what he was doing without any uh, understanding at all that he and I were in the same city here in London, Ontario. And he was just so intrigued and curious at what I was doing that that was one of those um, meeting points that just seemed divinely orchestrated. And the the encouragement and the doors that have been opened um, uh, from, from Gare in the years since that was most definitely one of them. I think also about when I mentioned how I kind of got roped into co-hosting that radio show about racing (laughs) that I knew nothing about. Uh, A fellow by the name of Mike Kilbreth, who was the one who engineered all of that and asked me for my help. Um, Little did I know what I was destined for um, when he did that. But the one that I, I, uh, I thought about this in advance of the discussion, Warren, a friend of mine named Derek Botton and Derek and I became friends um, because we were co-announcers at the racetrack. He was the pit reporter and I was the tower guy. Mm-hmm. And we became very, very close friends. Derek is really well known here in Southwestern Ontario as a radio personality. And I, I mentioned about being at the gym. I probably wouldn't have been there to hear Chan if I hadn't followed Derek there because we used to go in the mornings and, and play squash and just chin wag and the, the sauna. And, um, but 
when things really broke apart for me in 2010, 11, uh, I leaned on him hard. And I didn't understand until much later um, how heavy that lifting is. When your phone rings, uh, when a text comes, when an email comes uh, from someone who's hurting that you love. And you've got your own things that you're trying to do. <laughs> you have your own life, you have your own work, you have your own worries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I know that that went on for a long time and that I really struggled for a long time. And I didn't even think at that time, I was thinking about my own pain. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about what that was like on his end. And now that I'm almost a decade through the other side of that, um, when I have people reaching out to me or when they come up to me after I give a talk and their eyeballs are shaking because you just know that something that you've shared has met them right where they are and, and they've been given a sense of, oh, I'm actually okay. I'm not as flawed as I thought I was. Um, I think about Derek and, uh, and just being there. And there's that thread again, right? Of just being there for other people. Um, and how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've heard myself saying more recently that I wish I'd known decades sooner uh, is how powerful listening is. Not to be stereotypical or chauvinistic, but especially as guys, we want to we want to fix everything. <laughs> we just jump right to the fix or to the to the solution, or where a lot of times the listening is the fix. Mm -hmm. We just want to be heard, especially in our relationships. Um, and, and Derek always did that for me. And, and now I'm starting to learn as I'm creeping up on 50, uh, how impactful that can be when we do that for each other. So I hope I can be um, enough of a, of a no schedule man to be completely present wherever I am um, so that I can really be there for, for whoever needs me like he has always been for me. And just like the radio announcer was on your transistor radio for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now you'll know what it's like if you've been a family member or a friend who's, who's really going through the mud mm -hmm. and that yes, you see the name come up on your phone, just to be honest about it. It's kind of, ugh. <laughs> We're all going through it with the COVID pandemic. Yep. Somebody wants to talk about that and, and you know, ugh, just, but, but we need to share, you know, we need to be heard. We need to be there for each other. So how can we do that? and kind of protect our own peace and maintain our own energy at, at the same time. And uh, I think that's an interesting balance to examine and practice. I was uh, listening to a uh, podcast by Simon Sinek and, and he had a gentleman on there who was in the military. And uh, he said, basically when guys come back from military, when they come back from combat, right? It's not if they're going to have to deal with what, what happened, it's just a matter of when. Yeah. Every if it's when, and he related it back to COVID. Actually, interestingly enough, said like we're kind of we're we're in we're in combat, we're in a battle, we're in a fight, right? And when the everybody's going through it, and he says so, it's not a matter of of you know if you're going to have to deal with the fallout of that, it's just a matter of when. And and he said one of the you know the solutions to that is when you know when somebody um, is hurting, when someone is struggling, when someone is trying to trying to make their way through. He said it's not about trying to fix them. It's about just listening to them. It's just about being there and holding that space. Let them work through it, right? And let them, because we're all going to go through this. At, and, at, you know, there's some people at the beginning, some people in the middle, some people at the end, right? But it's having that, it's just being that voice or being that ear just to let them, allow them to actually move that energy through to get to the other side. Yeah, that's well said. I completely agree. So, now, what are you doing presently right now, Kevin, to better the pond? And the other, and the, and this next part of that question is, is why are you doing it? Well, I believe that we all have our own unique voice and vision, values, skills um, that deserve to be shared and celebrated. And whether that's our personal story uh, or that of uh, you know, who we are and, and why we're in business. You know, in business, we talk about what we do and, and, and how we do it. Very few of us talk about who we are. Mm -hmm. 
or why we do what we do to go back to Simon Sinek's thing. So the work that I do, one of my companies is called NSM Brand Media, which is a social media marketing and content creation company helping small to, to mid-sized businesses. How was that for an elevator pitch? That sounded really <laughs> slick, didn't it? I did, very. But what we really do, we're, we're trying to, to um, maybe make the, the marketing and internet world a little bit of a better, more human place, bring more humanity to the communication to create deeper emotional connection and deeper relationships, help businesses grow by building relationships and, and in doing that by helping them discover more about themselves of, of, of who they are. Why do you do what you do? Who are the kinds of people that you feel that you're uniquely equipped to serve and why would they be interested in, in doing business for you? What do you stand for? You can't say price, you can't say quality and you can't say service because that's what everybody says. Mm -hmm. So you're all guilty by association in my mind. <laughs> Uh, and I should, as the customer, just be able to assume those that I'm going to get those things anyway, or I won't be back. So what do you stand for? Who are you? And helping people see just by sharing the stories of who they are and what they do and their every day. It's, it's really fun, Warren, to see the lights go on that we maybe take a photo of, of something that's stuck on the wall at their place of work that they don't even notice mm -hmm. or are maybe even embarrassed about. And we share that on Instagram and it gets more engagement <laughs> than anything else they do because it shows part of the personality of who they are. And I don't see that enough of us are doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that idea and in helping people, I think we've seen as much as ever through this COVID pandemic, what happens when we turn the lights off and where do people communicate and how are they communicating? And, and to a large extent, that's online and through tools like social media, mm -hmm. but we don't back to something that we used earlier or talked about earlier. I, I don't think that we communicate and connect with each other as human beings, the way that we advertise at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so to help with that discovery and that implementation is, is really rewarding. One of the things that we're, we're on hold with now because of the pandemic, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting back to was the monthly event series that we were doing here in London called Mo Mondays, which was short for Motivational Mondays loosely, which was operating in several cities across Canada. We just did the London one. And I would describe it as like TEDx meets the Tonight Show with a little bit of the Muppet Show tossed in where we would have four other individuals plus myself that we would all give a talk like a speech of about 10 minutes or less where we share a story right. about ourselves and our journey uh, and and bring everybody back up at the end and do kind of a Q&A panel with the audience that that doesn't sound like much but it's it's been extremely powerful mm. and uh, that was one of the things that I was enjoying more than anything else I was doing seeing people share and the power of sharing something about themselves with strangers and feeling that being met with appreciation and having that appreciative energy sent back to them. Uh, I learned after doing this for five or six months that, that it was overloading their emotional circuits. I would call them about three o'clock in the afternoon the next day and found that it wouldn't be uncommon when I asked them how they were doing, that they were still in pajamas and full of tears because they were getting flooded with messages of people who were so touched by what they shared. Mm. And they didn't, realize that how powerful they are mm -hmm. i really miss that um and i really miss meeting with people doing conferences and doing events in person and sharing the talk that i do that i enjoy the most is called rise like a phoenix race like a turtle that deals with some of this mindset stuff that i i just share some of what i've shared with with you here today and the trouble the the challenge with that warren from the sales perspective is that I know that I can go into a corporation, a nonprofit, a community group, a rotary club, and, and, and I will connect with the people that are in there because it's a very human kind of a universal thing. The trick is that's a lousy sales pitch, which is why this, the marketing stuff exists. <laughs> um, and I've done a little bit of that online, but I just don't find that anywhere near as rewarding mm -hmm. as when you can feel and share the energy with each other when you're in the room. Um, so I very much look forward to, uh, to, to, to getting back to that whenever that time is right. And 
connecting with and, and hopefully uplifting in a, in a sincere way um, as many people as I can. And I think that is an amazing way to better the pond. And that is the whole reason why this podcast uh, exists is for, you know, is to share stories from people like you who are doing all these, you know, these incredible things to make the world a better place. It's really an honor to be included, Warren, and to, um, to be more connected with you so that we'll be able to keep an eye out for each other and maybe trade some of those phone calls and texts uh, along the way as well. Because one thing I've learned that when you're in the pond is all of us are treading water or maybe need a life jacket <laughs> here or there. So it's good to have some others out there swimming uh, that we know are keeping an eye out for us. So thank you so much for this invitation. I'm, I'm really honored. Uh, and I thank you for your time. But I have one last question for you. So Kevin Ballmer, if you were standing at the top of a mountain and the whole world was intently listening to you, what would you say? That's a question worth some consideration. It would probably be something along the lines of what we we talked about sooner to or sooner earlier um, to encourage some reflection upon the idea of whose map are you following and whose treasure are you trying to find and are you delaying your idea of gratification until you find that treasure or are you choosing maybe it would be a question maybe it would be this question how would you choose to feel hmm. well i want to feel good okay great and why don't you? <laughs> What's stop? And then there are a whole bunch of choices that come <laughs> rocketing through that. But you should just try to, to share something about, you know, really think about whose life you're, you're living, right? And, 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 and um, not going out. A friend of mine says, live worry-free, leave regret-free. And uh, that's his, my, my good friend, Coach Rakesh Mishra. So I didn't come up with that. But too many of us get to the, the, the end of the journey or close to what we think is the end of the journey. And then we start having those conversations with ourselves about, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Say it now. You know, try it now. Let it go now. Forgive it now. Ask yourself how you would choose to feel and uh, um, forge your own way. Be brave enough to go to your, your own schedule <laughs> and make the map up as you go. And make it map up as you go. Excellent. So, Kevin, again, I really, truly uh, uh, heartfelt thank you uh, for, number one, everything that you're doing to better the pond. Uh, and I, I respect that highly. And I want to thank you for your time today to share your stories with, my, with all my listeners. And, and I, I'm sure that they'll all walk away inspired and, and want to do something differently because uh, of, of who you are and what you had to tell them today. I, it's my honor, Warren. Thank you for the opportunity to get to know you and to share some stories. And uh, thanks to anyone who may be uh, still watching or listening. Um, would, would be happy for anyone to, to connect, as I'm sure that, uh, that you would as well. And uh, let's just all keep looking out for each other. Absolutely. So where do my listeners find you, Kevin? Noschedulemancom is the easiest thing to remember and the, the hub that will lead you to all things related to Kevin Bulmer for sure. And <laughs> no schedule man.com. And you are active on Facebook, LinkedIn. Or yeah. I haven't been as active on Facebook uh, recently, depending on when, when somebody comes across this, maybe they they're listening in uh, 2023 and they're like, geez, he's all over it. Or maybe Facebook isn't a thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but here in 2021, I've actually been most active on TikTok where my handle is um, my real success coach. That's probably going to change back to no schedule man at some point, but that's another story for another podcast. Um, but all of those links are, are on my, uh, my website. And um, through this pandemic, I've just been investing more time in helping other businesses with their social media presence than my own. But yeah, you can find me on, on LinkedIn as well. Just search Kevin Bulmer or probably the term no schedule man. I'd probably come up. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Yeah, there's that's only one. So I would think so. <laughs> All right. There you have it, folks. It was a great time here today with Kevin and Balmer. Thank you again for your time. This is Warren Berry flocking off to take you beyond the pond to better the pond. 
because we're better together. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Warren.